Hello, I'm Esther Perel and uh, thank you for waiting. We've had some technical challenges, but we are back and here to stay. Um, we are having a meeting in my house this evening to accompany the launch of uh, my new online workshop, Rekindling Desire, Essential Ingredients for a Passionate Life. I am a therapist, I am a speaker, I'm an author, and uh, I wrote Mating in Captivity quite a while back, but over the years people kept saying, so once I've read the book, what do I do? And so that's where I began to feel like, okay, time to translate for you, wherever you are in this world, how to rekindle the energy, the desire, the spark, the motivation for a different kind of sensuality, for a different kind of erotic connection with your partner. And um, that's why this workshop, you will see it, it has seven different modules, it has hours of content and multiple exercises, but what it doesn't have, which I still miss very much and have when I am able to see you in my office, is the face-to-face -face contact, where you get to ask me questions pertinent, relevant, specific to your own situation, and I get to answer you in a way that is probably less general than when I try to um, create a more collective response. And so I invited a group of friends, it's Sunday evening, I like to be in my home and have wine and cheese and talk about all these pertinent questions. And I thought, rather than be alone in my answer, we'll have a conversation um, like I would like you to have when you are having those discussions with your friends, with your family. I have colleagues here, I have friends here, because much of the conversations about sexuality, about intimacy, is often silenced, is often not a collective one where you get the input of others. Most people don't know what actually goes on in other people's lives when it comes to these issues. And so a part of my mission is to make the conversation about intimacy and sexuality public and without it being either sanctimonious or smutty. And for that, I brought a whole group of people to it's join me. It's not smutty. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> you can do that part. I'll keep it. <laughs> so, so, so that, that question was interesting. I wonder if you need to read it. I'm going to read it again, but I thought maybe Mohan can, can quickly introduce us and begin the circle of introduction. So I'm Mohan Surf. I am a neuroscientist and try to use my understanding of the brain to predict and explain people's behavior. I speak louder. Uh, and I'm not married and I have no kids. In the context of this conversation, it's probably important to know that. Yes, but I do want to say that when I have questions about neuroscience and about where the behavior and the brain intersect, this is the person I will turn to. So, thanks for being here. Yes, Marie-Christine. Marie-Christine, I am from Switzerland. I live in New York. I am in a long-term, very long-term relationship. And I have two teenagers. So, yeah. Good. Hello all, my name is Malika Bomek. I'm a therapist here in New York City, I'm working with adults and couples, and I bring a multicultural focus to the work that I do. Um, and it's my passion in life, and that's what I'm, that's how I know Esther, and that's what brings me here. My name is Ali Bogard, I'm a yoga and meditation teacher here in New York City, and I am neither married nor with kids for this theme. Mm -hmm. But you have a relationship history, and you a have a sexual one. life, a long one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, right. I think that it, that we should not frame ourselves as either, you know, there is the coupled ones and the uncoupled ones. Mm -hmm. I think that all of us have relationship lives, mm -hmm. and some of us are in a couple today and won't be tomorrow, and some of us are not in one today and may be tomorrow, mm -hmm. and some of us are in more than one couple at the same time. So I think that we want to stay away from the there is the norm, and then mm -hmm. there is everybody who doesn't fit the norm, because part of what we're trying to do is to broaden the norm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Zach. I'm Zach. Uh, I work largely in digital marketing and we do some behavioral psychology to design products and campaigns to get people to do things that our products would like them to do. Um, so this has always been a really nice conversation between Esther and I. Uh, I am single. I've been in a few pretty serious relationships, but have not been for a while. I'm Rachel. I'm an old friend of Esther's. I have been in many long monogamous relationships. One of them was a 21-year marriage. Um, I'm no longer in that. Two kids, not a virgin. Hoping not to <laughs> die a virgin. <laughs> and uh, this conversation is this very much 
front and center in my life right now. Right, right. So we received a lot of questions, and I think um, just to get us going, we're going to use the questions from the people and riff together and, uh, and basically talk with all of you, wherever you all are. Um, do I have any advice for couples that work together as partners in business as well as, well, that work together as partners in business? People who are working together and also want to be able to still have a romantic, erotic relationship as intimate partners. Any of you have ever worked with your partners? I have. Yes. I, have. <laughs> <laughs> I, have. I will never again. <laughs> I had I had the offer of, of working with my husband, and I totally refused. Why? For those reasons, uh, I think I think it must be ex extremely challenging to work with your with your partner because uh, in terms of on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so I I think that. It's much better that I do my own thing and he does his thing, and it's it's, it's a clear separation mm -hmm. between those mm -hmm. two. But if you do work together, see, I think that the on some level there's a challenge that we all share, which is how do you put the quotidian aside, how do you put the productive aside, and how do you engage with the pleasure and the erotic? How do you stop trying to achieve and be purposeful, and you enter a space that is more Radium that is more just for its own sake. It's actually a more yogic state in that sense. And all of us have that challenge. I think people who work together need much more of a concerted effort to create that separation. Mm -hmm. I actually grew up in family business. Mm -hmm. I grew up above my parents' store. And I remember so well, my parents, every time we would start talk, the clients who came down, and then if somebody somebody would say, okay, we don't talk about the shop anymore. <laughs> we don't talk about the shop. And two minutes later, we were back in the shop. <laughs> you know, we tried so hard to not, you know, to kind of, they were hoping, you know. So I don't know what happened after that, but I do know that that distinction and the concerted effort, probably a ritual, you know, people used to come home and they used to take off their work clothes, their farm clothes, their smelly horse clothes. There was a way in which they transitioned. And mm -hmm. I think that the concept of transition is really getting lost, especially because our work is in our phones, it's going with us everywhere. So there's very little delineation. That's number one. I would do anything for that. And then the second piece is the, the, the fact that many of us bring our best self to work and don't bring our best self to our relationships. Mm -hmm. We are charming, we would never dare to scream, we would never dare to not say thank you and please, we are polite, I mean, we bring our better self, you know, we are focused, we are attentive, we are engaged, we are everything that makes for good sex with our partner at work, with our colleagues and with our clients, and we don't give that quality of attention at home. Actually, there's a plenty of partners who mm -hmm. talk like this. Mm -hmm. One thought I have about that, I just remember it right now, is that I think the question assumes the idea that you work in the same business. But even if that's not the case, even if you don't work in the same business, mm -hmm. you probably, as a couple, would have a project that you have to work on yeah. together. Mm -hmm. Starting with having a kid, or even, I think, getting married it involves usually a ceremony mm -hmm. that takes a year of like choosing the flower and the mm -hmm. font of the invitation. So you will have projects as couples. And that project is a, something you work together. You come back home and you start sitting next to the table and you say, okay, you take this one, I'll take this one, you manage this, I manage that, who's gonna be in charge? So I think that even not just a case where you actually work in the same salary making mm -hmm. profession, you would have a project together. So the, sol the solution of this problem is something that you have to think about regardless of like whether it's in the business world or if it's like a project that you take on, which is I making the kitchen again. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's life. That's life. I, that's life. I think in this question we often focus a lot on how people deal with this at home with the transition there, but we tend not to think of work as one of the things that is a variable of the equation. And one of the things that I see pretty commonly is there are couples that everybody at work knows are couples, mm -hmm. and then there are couples that people at work don't know are couples. Mm -hmm. And for me, I went from one to the other. Mm -hmm. People didn't know, and then they did know. And what was really interesting is that once people were aware of it, there was some compassion around keeping me out of scenarios that could complicate my home life, because I worked in an overall nice environment. But when you have to actively hide that you are a couple during the day, mm -hmm. that really jarred me it's a very a good lot. point. And it also put, didn't allow other people to be respectful of the fact that 
I probably don't want to be the person doing the performance review for my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. That's just not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So allowing a different manager to do that because everybody knew what you were doing was really helpful. I've known couples who would have a 10 minute silent ritual. They just would hold each other mm -hmm. and say nothing. Just, it could be three minutes, it doesn't really matter. But they just had a way of kind of switching over. I've had people who, ch I had a couple who for a while just went on different names. They had names for home yeah. and names for work. It's playful. It doesn't last. You can't do this necessarily for 10 years, but it was a good way to kind of reconnect with another part of themselves. I had people who make sure that they never come home at the same time. And I had people who make sure that they come home at the same time. It's a very interesting thing. The, shall we leave work together? Do we wait for each other? Do we kind of match ourselves or do we actually create differences and differentiation, different rhythms so that we, we still, you know, I had people who never talked to each other at work about home as if they were gone somewhere else. And so, and then I have people who make sure that on the reverse, they never talk about work if they can, you know, as they come home. But it is a challenge. I think that really, um, there is something about, <clears throat> I don't like the way you're doing this. This is now I'm gonna talk co-founders actually. Don't like the way, yeah, we like a little bit of water. Oh, I don't like the way you're doing this. You're trusting people too much. You haven't been on to this. I'm, you know, so you have the compounding of all the frustrations. It's like the things that go well, if they go well at work, will make the couple thrive even more. And the things that don't go well, if they don't go well at work either, will become even worse. I think that it really is a, if I admire you and I like the way you're doing things, I'll be even more enchanted. And if I actually question you and I'm ambivalent about the way you do things and whatever it is that I don't like, it will be magnified. I think you just get the double dose of everything. I also think there's the physical space part of this, yeah. which is the bedroom. We used to have a rule that we couldn't bring any work onto the bed. Yeah. You just don't physically invade. How many of you bring your phone to your bedroom? I think another important piece of it too, and it's the modern day equivalent of you saying don't talk about the shop is having no screen time between partners. Yes. But one of the things that always ignites desire for me is having um, mental differentiation. So they've got a world that's different yes. than the world I know. Mm -hmm. And if we're working in the same world, I start to get bored. I love being fascinated mm -hmm. by somebody's mm -hmm. world. And so if people work together, I think it's important that at least there's hobbies or passions or friends yeah. that I can go learn from. Yes, yeah. yes, I think that's a very, very important point. But I would say that that point of stronger differentiation for me is probably core to any erotic couples. Mm -hmm. Otherness. Mm -hmm. And that cultivating of otherness, what you call that different mental space or different passions, different interests, a person to discover, someone to meet, yeah. a bridge to cross, and someone to visit on the other side, mm -hmm. I think I, I would broaden that as an essential idea mm -hmm. to erotic couples. Yeah, I'm thinking about sort of as we were just talking about the, the fact that so many of us meet our partners in a workplace kind of a setting, but then that's the very sort of, sort of like, it's ultimately becomes part of the problem is that there's so much overlap in lifestyle and interests. But I think about whatever that sort of spark was in the initial sort of glimmerance phase or the, that sort of, that connection that, that created, that fostered a relationship that went beyond the professional. But that, that line when you were colleagues and there was that additional sort of erotic component and spark and attraction and how to cultivate that so that you're not losing it because it's sort of now we're business partners mm -hmm. and now we're because Correct. you drew that person in from that place of individuality and separateness from the start. Let's do another question, but just to kind of tell everyone who's joining us now, this is our Facebook Live conversation on rekindling desire that goes along with the launch of this new online workshop with the same name. And I'm Esther Perel with my friends in New York City, Sunday evening, having wine and cheese, showing you ways to have these conversations We've never actually discussed some of these things with each other, and I hope you can find your community, your friends, your close ones with whom to unpack some of these questions, for whom there isn't always such an easy, clear answer. So here's another one. As the higher sex drive partner, how can I influence my partner to rekindle 
his drive. So the first thing I would probably change is the drive word. But I know that probably many of you were thinking it was going to be her drive. Because <laughs> that's the stereotypic way of thinking. And I think that that's a very honest question. It's not in at all straightforward in the straight couple as in fits her drive. But I would probably start with not talking about it as drive. What I would, would talk say? about motivation. I wouldn't make it biological. It's me, I'm more motivated, I'm more interested, I have a better relationship mm -hmm. to my sexuality, mm -hmm. I desire more sexual connection, it's a language in which I like to express myself. Um, I wouldn't bi make it biological because then it presupposes that you do not have much control over it. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I invite a partner that isn't interested? And I don't know if it's in me, in it, in themselves, vis-a-vis -vis this, mm -hmm. you know, what's the block? What is it that I'm trying, who am I trying to bring into this conversation with me? And what is it that stops you? So that's the first thing I would say is like, um, if I'm, I'm more interested, I, am, I, <clears throat> I enjoy sex, I, um, I like to connect with myself and with my partner sexually or sensually, I, I have good memories of my sexu of sexuality. Versus, I am with a partner, I have an experience of sexual abuse, I feel very inhibited, um, any thought can stop me. But actually, my mind, the way my mind works is a series of inhibiting cognitions that makes me not want, versus my partner, everything could make them want more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? There's a beautiful list from Amelie Nagoski of, of questions like that, of how one person everything will become another reason for why not, mm -hmm. and the other person, everything will become a reason for why yes. Mm -hmm. That's not about drive, that is a real mental and physical state. And how not, my, my imagination about a question like this is, there's a pursuer, somebody who wants, mm -hmm. and there's a distancer or a withholder or withdrawer, somebody who doesn't. And the one who wants often feels lonely, rejected, unloved, unwanted, etc. And the one who feels pressured, feels guilty and resentful and wishes to be left alone and would like to, but can't or doesn't want to or doesn't feel like they'll ever do it well enough. And it touches so many other pieces that is way beyond just high and low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an entire relationship dynamic that plays itself around this. Ever been in, on one side or the other? In your I've been on both. on both. And so that's why I would say it's not biological. And, and to me, and maybe this is being in the body of a woman, it usually depends on how much I feel they're pulling from my energy and my energy body. And it's not usually sexual, it's how much they're demanding of me mentally, energetically, emotionally, that will make me either the pursuer or the distancer. And so that's why I feel it's not biological. Are we talking about a conversation, how to have the conversation with this person? That's what's so hard in my experience is, usually it's either resentment, it's resentment on either side, either, ugh, or it is like, you don't mm -hmm. want me. So either way, it's such a loaded conversation. How do you have that conversation in order to find out the answers to the questions you were posing? Uh, so uh, to me, if it, you know, when people come to me, they've often already tried that conversation many yeah. times. They started out really nice, sweet, kind, and then over the years, they became less sweet and kind. Mm -hmm. So they're frustrated, they're rejected, they're lonely, they've had it, they've, they've already had the affair, they're about to have an affair, I mean, they, they don't wanna live like this anymore, they feel trapped, they feel the other person is holding them hostage, they don't wanna lose their children sometimes, or, the, or their status or their lifestyle. So mm -hmm. the worse it gets, the more I imagine the conversation starts with the letter. I, I, <clears throat> I don't think you go, and you try one more time to have the same chat right. because you've often had that chat and it's useless. And the letter really starts with, hi Johnny, or hi Jeanette, you know, um, I'm sitting here, I actually had a conversation tonight, or I was listening to these people have this conversation, and I realized that it's been so long since we actually had an honest chat. You know, we fight quickly, or we argue, or we avoid each other, or this is the elephant in the room, or we never talk about it, we never talk about it. That's the other big one. It's not like we've tried and right. it hasn't worked. <clears throat> and I realized that um, I don't know. I don't even know if you miss it. I don't know if you think it's a problem. I don't know if you even remember the last time we were together. Um, I don't want to count, but I think it's been four years. 
or mm. last time or twice last year. I mean, the numbers are often so gutting so. when people say them out loud like this. Um, I miss you. I miss you. I miss us. I miss this connection. I miss being touched. I miss being smelled. I miss, you know, being kissed. And um, and I need to hear from you because this is not just about not being sexual. This is about feeling a completely disconnected and lonely. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything I've done or if there's anything that you feel I could do, um, and since we don't talk about it, maybe in writing we'll be able to. Um, don't answer me directly. Whenever you want, I know where to go look under the pillow. Something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're alone. You don't have the person there stone you know, stonewalling you. You, you know, that's one version. I talk, I talk, I talk. You stay quiet. I talk, I talk, I talk more. Mm -hmm. um, or you just basically, you're not blaming. You're not attacking. You're just saying, what's up? And what are we going to do? Because this, and some couples can go on for many years, yeah. many years, until until the shit hits the fan. There will be a crisis. I mean, there's people live too long these days to just live like this, mm -hmm. like that. At some point, something happens. A child leaves the house, a parent dies, an ex reappears, Facebook surprises us on a good day. Um, you know, something will suddenly say, I once was someone else. I once lived differently. I remember myself, mm -hmm. let alone I remember us, or we never had it. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could live without it, but I can't. Um, and so me, anything I can do for this to happen before the crisis, I'll help. Thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I I am in this very long-term relationship, and and we are really good partners together. So, to me, the concept of four years feels like tragic. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking more like a few days or a <laughs> <laughs> week. <laughs> no, but but just purely, if one pa partner is not in the mood and the other one is in the mood, and I'm not talking about time because I think it's irrelevant. Um, I, I, I think it's a question of giving space, but at the same time creating mood. You know, if one partner is not in the mood and the other is in the mood, so maybe you do something else together. Maybe you watch a funny video, or maybe you take a bath, or you know. But but that I realize it's not the four years issue thing. It's more. It's more no, but you said something that's very interesting. If I have felt rejected, mm -hmm. right? If I'm the person and I have felt rejection, rejected, it's more likely that I'm going to do this just a little bit. And if you don't immediately... Very impossible to say, though, right? Wait, read that one more time. I think yes. we were paused. My husband is interested in having sex with another man. I want to share this experience with him. Is this a good idea? Will it bring us closer? It's the easiest version of this question because she seems like her husband wants and she is 90% there. Is it a woman though? No. Uh, we don't know if it's, yes, a woman. A woman. It's a, it is a woman. So a good question. Yeah. Her <laughs> yes. boyfriend wants to have sex with another man and she That's wants to be true. in it. So she, yeah. doesn't want, she wa doesn't want to not do it. She doesn't want to, uh, she, she, all she wants is like herself to be part of it, which is the, I think the easiest version of this sure. question that I can imagine. If he's up for it too. Yeah. And then it can, of course, then it becomes a very, uh, it can be a very fun fantasy yeah. playing out a threesome in which she's an observer, she gets to see him in a different aspect of himself, in a different sexual experience. Um, I think as a whole, you know, my first thing is, is he, what's he saying? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Is exactly. he, does he want you there? Yeah. Right. You exactly. know, does he, does he enjoy the twist and experience of this? Does he enjoy the voyeurism of it? Mm -hmm. Does he enjoy you watching him? Do you want to participate? Do you yeah. want to be a viewer? Does he like to be seen mm -hmm. in this and way? And what are her motives? Is she kind of there to monitor or is she there to participate? Correct. You know what I mean? Is and it an anxious involvement? Yes. yes. But yeah. is he exploring his sexuality <coughs> as right. in maybe I'm not? Great. Like what is going well, on? And, and that's why it's hard to say if it'll bring them closer together because yeah. it might open a doorway to desire in to that realm that we didn't know. But I think the only thing we could guarantee is that it'll open up healthy communication for what they both want. But it's almost impossible to say whether it will make them closer or not. I think that 
you have two things. The conversation about it, yeah. if it's not an anxious conversation, can make people much closer. Mm -hmm. I think that good conversations about fantasy are intensely intimate mm -hmm. because you enter the interior sexuality mm -hmm. of a person, the, the interior erotic landscape, and that is intensely intimate and closer. Sometimes from there, people don't even want to go and have the experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they yeah. do. If they will feel closer or not afterwards, I think is, a, is you have, this is risk taking. Yeah. Yes. And this risk taking cannot give you a secure answer. Mm -hmm. That is, if you're in the realm of risk taking, you have to be in the realm of possibility and curiosity and not knowing what the outcome will be, but be open to many outcomes. If it's not good, it's not good, you change. Mm -hmm. You don't do it again. But you cannot have a risk-taking experience that demands a kind of a guarantee of safety yeah. of that sort. Let's look at some of the others. Um, um, yeah, you know, I do want to say it just because you're, you're all here having the bonus, but um, there's a major bonus here that I've actually offered to all the people that have signed on to the course. And you have till tomorrow, actually you have to till 8.30 tonight to sign on, but you will know the answer tomorrow, to have 45 minutes alone with me. So I basically am offering um, a private wow. session with me. Um, do, I have to do you want to clarify that? Like, what do you mean? If, if I sign up when? You sign up between now and 8.30, between now and when we end. 8.30 Eastern time. As Eastern time, New York time. So Probably 8.45 now, because we started just started minutes minutes late. Okay, so let's say 8.45. When oh, we end this okay. conversation, you will have signed on for the course, Rekindling Desire, you get to be part of a draw, and you may be the person, and I can tell you the person who already was chosen, because we've had two that we've offered like that, you know, um, was very moved, she was very mm -hmm. moved. Uh, I don't know who she is yet. Um, we also will be signing a host of uh, book copies that I want to personally dedicate to you. Um, we also, at this point, are offering that if you do have a partner, that your partner gets to register for free. Um, and you also will be part of a community like this on Facebook, a private Facebook community, which I have actually been able to participate in. And I have to say, for a long time, I thought, ah, oh, it cannot be an interesting conversation online like that and with all this. It's amazing. Who are the other people? People from all over the world. People from all over the world, thoughtful, caring, probing, deep, supporting each other, challenging each other, like the best kind of group therapy. I thought never can this work online like this. I was the skeptic. You, you know the generation I am. I'm not a millennial. This was not where I had grown up. I thought you have to have face to face. And I have to say, and you lead the group. I enter. I enter. I don't lead. It's uh -huh. self-led. It's a conversation. But I enter. I join. I participate. I give my input. So all of that comes with the signing on in the next hour. But we're going back to our questions. Um, no, we've done this one. Oh, this is a very good one. I can't get started. How do I get this unmentionable? Can't you get started? The experience or the conversation? Um, they both, right? This is a man. This is a man, right? How do we start? How do we how do we start a conversation when things have become so frozen? Or how do we start? How do we initiate? How do we approach someone um, when things have been very frozen? And this, to me, is part of the same risk taking. I really think mm -hmm. it's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's vulnerable. I saw a young couple this week, a gay couple. And the, said, the guy said, you know, I'm still very much in love, it's the beginning, but I know that at some point I'm going to want to meet other men, other guys. And, and I said, well, have you had the conversations? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to have this conversation. And I'm like, look at it, you're a 24-year-old gay man in New York City, and if you cannot have this conversation, how stereotypical, totally stereotypical. How if you can't have this conversation, what, what, you know, and I'm thinking, why is it? I mean, why is it? I'd love to hear your thoughts on why even someone who sort of seems like a good candidate to have a conversation like that is still so silenced or so, you know, is worried. What are they worried about? Or shame? Why is shame? The shame is part of it. I think the big thing for me mm -hmm. is once you've chosen me, and mm -hmm. make, and I'm the one, mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to be the one more and better, or you know, all the others that were not chosen. The minute this conversation begins, it starts to be with, I'm not enough. Yeah. The first thing people begin to think is, I'm not enough. 
I'm comparing myself. You still think about your exes. You, you know, I mustn't be pleasing you, or I'm, you mustn't be attracted enough to me, or a variety of the I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. You're smiling. I'm smiling because it's such a thin line between I'm not enough, you're not enough, and this isn't right. And so that, or this isn't right for me, or it's not the one. So that thin line between how I'm coming up into resistance inside a relationship, I'm not enough, or it's just not it. Mm -hmm. Or, which is a very difficult thing to know when you have a lot of choice. And I think we're inside of the overwhelm of choice, especially if you speak of the millennials or New York City is a weird microcosm, but we're in a paralyzing state of an overwhelm of choice. Yes, yes. What about that, the kind of relationship that's like open or yeah. something like that? Like, what what do you, what what is your view and experience of <clears throat> quote open relationships where it's neither that you're not enough or that this isn't right? It's just that I want multiple. I mean, for me, the conversation is not about closed and open. I really have never thought of it in in, in that language. It's really you know. Um, What's your history? How have you experienced this part of your life? Has it been an easy part for you? Now, people can say, you know, tennis has been easy for me. I've always been a good tennis player. I've been a sport, I've been an athlete. No, I haven't been an athlete. And this, you know, I'm a good writer, I'm not a good writer. I feel confident as a writer. I feel insecure as a writer. Well, how about as a lover? You know, what's been your experience? Where have you learned? Who taught you? What did you learn? Did you learn it as a positive thing? Did you learn it filled with shame, filled with guilt? With silence. Whoever has that conversation in a couple, and that's the that's the simple conversation. Like you know, what, how how where did you find your sources when you were little? Did you were you misguided? Did people you know? I was nine years old when I figured there was no stork. Let me be honest. You know, <laughs> stork. That's what I got. The stork. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's 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 becoming more and more prevalent to realize how many people have been sexually abused as yes. well, which creates another whole shadow inside of this category. Men and women, boys oh, and girls. Yeah. Yes, you know. Did you you know in in the past there was code language, right? My mother put my hands above the sheets. You know, I had to sleep with my hands outside of the sheets. Everybody mm. understood what that meant. Yeah, mm. it was not going to be any self pleasing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But because you're not meeting your partner and having sex for the first time with the one you marry, and you come and you've had a nomadic existence, not all the people in our class, you know, of course in our community, but many, there, you have a whole history, you have a whole experience. What about your sexual life have you enjoyed? What would you like to maintain? What are the, what are the things that you would still like to experience? If there was something you could change, what would you change? What's the best advice you ever got about being, a, you know, about sexuality, about being a lover, about you know, what's the best, everybody asks, about, and every mastermind group people say, what's the best piece of advice you ever got about business? <laughs> you never say that about Why don't they say what's the best piece of advice you ever got about, about being intimate or sexual or recreational, it doesn't matter. What's the best piece of advice you ever got about being intimate? What's the best piece, I have to mm -hmm. think myself about, <laughs> you, that, that, that pleasure is something you take. It isn't just given to you. Mm. That's good. That's, That's good. As a woman, that was probably one of the most important lessons. That the pleasure is something you claim your pleasure. Mm -hmm. You feel entitled to it. You deserve it. You go seek it. Only you know what pleasures you. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And you don't put the man in the position of having to figure it out without you saying anything. And all you know to say is what you don't know or what you don't like because you actually have never had the chance to, to discover yourself. Mm -hmm. And that it has to do with, a, it comes with a level of self-acceptance and self-exploration. So many of us have that fantasy. Yes. You should know. You should just know. I don't want to have to tell you what I want. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just know? What would you say? I, on, on this particular best piece yeah, of advice? Yeah, on the, yeah, or on the best piece of advice. I actually don't want to speak to this point, yeah. because mm -hmm. I do think that as, as a man, we want to know. But oftentimes we're put in the scenario where, like you said, you're not the only person that we've been with. We have an entire history, and everybody is actually dramatically different. And it reminds me of, like, imagine walking into the SATs and having never been told what to study. There's just this myriad of things that we are supposed to all of a sudden know, but there's also, again, this fear and shame of actually discussing it. And then there gets, as a result, there's this fear of asking. Um, so I think a lot of it comes down to 
asking, but back to the original point, that's what's scary. Mm -hmm. I, I think that as soon as to you ask. Know, Why is asking scary? Because it presumes that you don't know. Because it presumes that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Rather than that, that you care. Right. <laughs> and I think that yeah. you know, going back to, right. again, the, the original question, a lot of the reason that it's so hard to start the conversation is, is fear. Mm -hmm. When you have no idea what the answer is, you can tell yourself whatever you want, convince yourself of whatever you want. But as soon as they open their mouth mm -hmm. and they tell you, like that's that's where it sits, mm -hmm. and you're scared that they're going to tell you, like, you know, on the relationship side, like I just actually don't want to be here anymore. And then you having that conversation has closed your window to fix it. Mm -hmm. Or on the sexual side, like, hey, you're not the right shape. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of room to be hurt when some when you actually ask. The you see, it's interesting because when I give the question, I can't get started. How do I mention this unmentionable? I have no idea. Is this man in a relationship? Right. Is it a long term relationship? Is this man in between, starting out? Um, is this man assuming that their partner, man or woman, couldn't be bothered? And so it's like I'm talking to someone who doesn't right. care. And then it starts to feel like as long as I didn't bring it up, I could still hope. Right. But now that I brought it up, I have the answer. There's solidity. And right. isn't it also just getting into inertia in physics? It takes the amount of energy to move to the degree it's stagnant or how long the conversation hasn't been had. So for some people, it's mildly uncomfortable. And for some people, they have to move 15 years worth of stuff to begin. Any of you have had experiences of rekindling, of, go of losing it and reclaiming mm -hmm. it? No, I'd always just get out. <laughs> yeah. Because? I'm the overwhelm of choice. Mm -hmm. There can always be more. You know, I think that's just the nature of being. And the fantasy alive, you know? that if it's good, it should just be good. The facilitating right. kind of interaction. Yeah, that's the biggest yeah. BS. Yeah. <laughs> this is really the thing. That idea that it just should magically happen. It's artful. It's, it's just a falls from heaven, it's spontaneous, you have to, you know, there is not a single other element of relationship to which we apply this kind of law. The exceptionalism of sex about this is quite amazing, yeah. you know, that, and, and then when you say, you know, there's an, there's an intentionality to it, there's an effort to it, that, that it should just happen. And there's a part of it I agree. It's like it's with some people you play music and you really you improvise well and you riff and why would you go play music with people that you just can't connect? And on the other hand, a relationship is more than just this one dimension. So the question is all the time, you know, how important is that dimension in the overall? You know, would you be with someone who doesn't play music when you're a musician or doesn't appreciate music? I can't imagine it. Mm -hmm. Would you be with someone who couldn't care less about certain things that you're passionate about? If sexuality matters to you a great deal, how do you live with someone mm -hmm. who is close to it? There is also in terms of a long-term relationship, there is the changes in life, you know, you have mm -hmm. babies and you <coughs> have period of time when, especially when you have baby, when you have children, you have, things are changing at times because of exhaustion, because of all of that, so then it's where the rekindling That happens. and resentment, yeah. anger, right. resentment, conflict, disconnect. Jealousy. You know, um, jealousy, but, it, but even the bigger basic disconnect, the majority, you know, couples will just stop paying attention. Yeah. It's as a kind of a complacency, a laziness. But, but that's, uh, I think that's the, or that is a word that's missing now, but, but the other partner, if there is a non-interest, mm -hmm. the other partner can step up and say, hey, I am here. Yes. You know, I think I think it's um, which is the risk taking that I yeah. always come back to. Yeah. I think yeah. on, on the flip side, there, like we're talking a lot about how when you basically fight for it and make it work. Mm -hmm. um, also, how do you bring it up? The question right. was really. The question is when is there an obligation to? I think mm -hmm. that we look at the overwhelm of choice as something that we are doing selfishly, but it's also something that they have an opportunity to go after if we're not present. Correct. Um, and I do think that, you know, as she mentioned, there's timing differences, right? When you have kids together, there's probably a lot more to fight for than if you're 25 and could probably just find someone who has a lot less water under the bridge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so where is that line where the right thing is to fight? And, and it's probably worth cutting loose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really hard to say. 
thank you. But maybe, yeah. Yes, Dan, you said something to me today, actually, mm -hmm. that I found really relevant to this conversation that I never thought of. You said most people, or a lot of people, especially if you're attractive and you're you, you have the experience of having, you know, strong chemistry with somebody, boom, and it's there on a platter, and you don't ever have the experience of having to, like, actually make it happen, right? But then, inevitably, it reaches a point where you do. <coughs> you just do. And that, for a lot of people, is just like, oh, well, forget that. I mean, it's on a platter, and I can recreate that over and over and over again mm -hmm. until you can't, mm -hmm. until you really can't. And it is about discovering how to make that happen together. Yeah. And you're going to have to do it anyway in any relationship over time. I, I, think I know that interesting. Thinking about how it's like a thoughtful and purposeful exercise, rekindling, but it's not just something that, like, as the stairs and drops from the sky or whatever. And I'm thinking about rekindling both kind of between partners, but also within, because, mm -hmm. like, there's a line, I think it's in a stare um, quote or something, but uh, about <clears throat> not mistaking your partner's invitation to be sexual as another need to meet. Something like, oh, no, yes. is it? which I thought. For me, it was a rekindling psychologically for me, mentally for me, to, to perceive differently my husband's advances. And I've been with my husband, I didn't mention this earlier, for 12 years, going on 13. Um, you know, it's and so. You should say when you met him, because that makes sense. I mean, I met him in high school. Oh, wow. A oh. million years ago, yeah. So we're one of those people <laughs> that really need to rekindle, because otherwise, you know, right. the years are ticking by. We were together through our 20s, so we didn't have all those experiences that. And I mean, I think the work has been done. So yeah, I mean, sort of. Um, uh, for me, I mean, so things shift as the years go by, and there are ups and downs. But I think the rekindling, from at least I'm speaking personally, has been largely on a, from a place of perception and appreciation of what we can play with because we have each other and we have partnership and there's a history there and all of that. So now it's sort of up to me. It's a, a task I'm sort of excited to take on around imagining us differently, trying new things. Right. I think there's the rekindling of like you're saying the baths and the watching the funny movie or just the, doing something outside like we just did something very different for valentine's day just because it's like let's do something different we went to this event at the uh, museum of natural history they have like this thing called it was romance under the stars it's like a oh, yeah. 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 and it's very cute and it's kind of perfect sort of for both of us because it's a jazz trio and we're both musicians and i'm into romance and there's sort of the constellations like uh, what is that in the uh, Hayden planetarium mm -hmm. they do like a you know so we're just like, let's do something else. You know, we kind of have our rut that we're in with our same flowers, and the, you know, so it, that was important. But I think equally important is that both he and I are reconceiving sort of one another. You know, there's that rekindling is equally important. Otherwise, we're gonna do the Valentine's Day thing and be like, ah, what's the point of this? You know, like you can kind of give up on it before you even really invite, you know, allow it to. Be. That deep end, you also yeah. continue the conversation of what do you want sexually and what are you into and mm -hmm. what is your fetish and what is your fetish. Like, do you still continue that conversation? That into it yeah I mean yeah and we revisit that conversation I think because it's 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 it is work to do this but I also want to say yeah. that what's very important for me is that that conversation has no age yeah and um, part of what I'm very interested in in the workshop is mm -hmm. to make sure that actually the, the central questions we would love to think yes there are differences age life stage kids menopause prostate cancer, you name it. There's a lot of illness, developmental issues, you know, but there is also the general conversation, just simply pleasure, touch, mm -hmm. sensuality, not performance sex, not outcome-driven sex, not genitally-based sex, just simply the, the experience of being seen as an erotic sexual being by your partner and vice versa, or partners. And for that, I really want to say, you know, I want to take it all the way till we die. Mm -hmm. Because that experience is a very different thing. Mm -hmm. You don't have the same body, but sex does not just belong to young people. It's not better for young people. It's actually generally better for people who know themselves better mm -hmm. and who accept themselves more and who feel more deserving that other people want to give to mm -hmm. them. That's what's going to make it good and not, you know, the, the classic criteria that we always want, which one person was, uh, was asking here, you know, We've gotten two very interesting questions. One is about age and one is about religion. 
because in a way we are talking in the, from a liberal stance here. Mm -hmm. We're using the word fetish, mm -hmm. we're using the word monogamy, we're using lots of boundaries, lots of conversations that other people, you know, one of the first feedback we got this week was a guy who wrote, you know, I come from a very religious background, just to hear you speak this way. You know, um, the fact that you're talking about sexuality, the fact that you, so talk about the unmentionable, I think when you're in it and you talk about sexuality all the time, you don't, you can't imagine that it is an unmentionable, even though I didn't grow up this way. I mean, this is something I have developed and learned and cultivated. Um, you know, here, how might you deal with different religious constructs? I.e. masturbation is not permissible in God's eyes when it is held by one person in the relationship and not by the other and it prevents the erotic exploration. Mm -hmm. Meaning, what if you have a, one partner who is, you know, you can have sex, procreative, missionary, um, you know, certainly no pleasing of yourself, etc., uh, etc. Et um, because I want, I will use the word masturbation not as just the touching of one's genital, huh? but the overall experience of self-pleasure. Um, and I think those are very significant differences in a relationship when you have, you know, for one person, there is a right and a wrong as it comes, you know, there is a sinful substract to the conversation about sex. Um, and there is God watching over you, knowing what you're doing. And then others of us, we think that the only one who knows what we're doing is ourselves. We don't have a higher power looking over us. So. <laughs> I've never had that experience. I have no idea. I actually grew up an Orthodox Jew believing pretty much none of what I was being told, hmm. um, and then the example that often you didn't believe what you were told. No, I mean, look, part of it had authority issues. So the fact that I was being told what was correct <laughs> immediately made me decide that it was wrong. Hmm. Um, but the flip side of that, not the flip side, but another aspect was I, I had a gay brother, and we grew up in a pretty orthodox community, where he he grew up being told that exactly what he knew himself to be was completely incorrect, hmm. um, and I think that caused a lot of issues and. I guess I'll dive into another story. I, I was talking to this guy who was the, the chief negotiator for the state of Israel. Um, and he said, at every negotiation, there, there's really two negotiations. He's negotiating with their negotiator, and then he's going back to his prime minister. Uh, and one of the problems that always exists uh, is that, let's say you're dealing with Hamas, when they turn around and try to negotiate with somebody, they're talking to Allah, and Allah doesn't come. Um, and I think that when you have something that is completely inflexible, mm -hmm. um, it's really, really hard to get past that. Um, and the honest answer is, is yeah. either they're going to get over their belief, and I, my guess is that a lot of it's coming from concern. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I had rabbis, et cetera, telling me that you need to do this or X, Y, or Z, a lot of it came from they actually want me to not be in hell. Um, and it's in a very, in a way that I didn't appreciate, still very, you know, loving. Um, but something's going to give. It's either their belief in what they're doing or their acceptance of that you have a different belief system. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, the only other thing that can give is, is this holistically worth it? And I think it's a pretty binary assessment. But in everything that I've seen, you know, a complete lack of flexibility in one of the variables in a relationship is really mm -hmm. unhelpful. Yeah. Right. So we're not talking about the content, we're talking about the rigidity itself. Yeah. 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 So there's another one here. There are actually two different directions. There are a bunch of questions about um, rebuilding trust and rebuilding a sexual connection after betrayal, after infidelity, mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. those kinds of pains and hurts and breaches. That's one set of questions. And the other one, which is a different, it's actually connected, is about um, is it still wrong, is it wrong to still have flirtatious conversations with an ex with whom you still have a sexual pull. And then the same, um, the same uh, variation, if a partner flirts a bit too much for comfort in front of us, how do we express our feelings without making the person feel wrong? And how do we set boundaries? Mm -hmm. So let's go with the infidelity. Any of you, because I think that, uh, I know, I know that many of the people who are interested in the workshop, we are, talking about Rekindling Desire, the online workshop that I have just launched, and Esther Perel, you probably know that because you're on my Facebook page. <laughs> um, and I'm here with my friends in New York City on a Sunday evening, discussing all that juicy stuff um, that I 
would like for you to be able to kind of be in, inspired by us to create your own circles of conversation. Um, you know, how do I allow you to reconnect? How do I trust that if that what that you really want me? After to, infidelity. Yes, so. after breach. It's a, generally, it's a, it's you know, there are different things. There's people who will say, you know, immediately thereafter we had sex of the best kind that we've ever had, because there is something about fear of loss that will rekindle desire. It's as if when I'm about to lose you, all my other defenses are no longer that important mm -hmm. because this loss is much bigger than any other small loss I was protecting myself against. Mm -hmm. Then there is the fading of that sometimes. Then there is the, how do I know you want to be with me? Yeah? Uh, then there is the, you know, I miss the lover because that part of us is not actually the strongest part. I came back for a host of reasons, but but I'm not really, you know, I miss it, I miss, or uh, I'm afraid that if I have love, made love to you and I have sex with you, you're gonna think that I'm letting you off the hook. That's another one. Or I'm angry that you let me have this affair and didn't notice and didn't stop me. Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's an uncommon one. Yeah, and in what ways did you contribute to my strength? Yeah, right. so now I am the guilty party, but there was no lead up to this? Right. Right. This is, like you said, there's many forms of betrayal, right? It's yeah. like, sure, I, if I cross the line of having a, a sexual relationship outside of our marriage, but there are all sorts of lines you may have crossed prior to that that right. we don't consider to be the sort of highest level of betrayal the way we sometimes do with infidelity. But how do, we, how do we open ourselves back up? It's really the question. How do I allow myself to once again give myself to you, trust that you want to be there, trust that I want to be there, be, be open, take risks, be vulnerable, be playful, um, rather than, you know, um, that's the fundamental question, is how do, do people um, allow themselves once again to have that touch without in that moment having 10 other thoughts that will make that hand mm -hmm. become a negative experience. Mm -hmm. And I think many of us must have been on both sides of that experience mm -hmm. too. Yeah, no, and, and what I could say for um, when I've been cheated on is that the only way I could regain trust and sanity, for lack of a better word, would be to put the trust back in myself and my choices. And so my safety wasn't in their hands. And, you know, the trust can build again and the, the ability to be transparent can build again. But that I had to first and foremost say, if I'm staying, it's because I want to stay. And my safety is dependent on me and my choices rather than the constant need for them to repay for what they did to make me feel safe again. Because I just always give away my agency and my power for them to make me feel safe. What did you say to yourself? That, um, that essentially that, that my safety is in my hands. My, my ability to trust is in my hands. My ability to decide how I show up in this is in my hands, not inside of theirs. How they show up is how they show up, and then I get to decide what I do with it. I can stay or I can go. But I can't stay because of their actions, because then I have no agency. I've got no power in the situation. And then I'm constantly looking for them to make it up or constantly making them feel Monitoring. guilty for not showing up. Yeah. And so I would just have to regain my, my choice, my, my power in it. So I have a very academic thinking that might be too boring. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that and then you can stop me if it becomes too boring. <laughs> uh, it has two components. Mm -hmm. Why do people cheat or wh what do people think about when they cheat? And the other one is how do you recover? Both are very sexy questions with boring answers. Uh, <laughs> so here's a, okay, so here's my uh, um, academic answer to why people cheat. So the reality is that we studied a lot about the brain and we try to figure out what components are involved in a person making a decision to do something that they know is a bad idea. And it could be cheating on their spouse, it could be stealing, uh, stealing it could be driving the car while texting or anything, it, and it boils down to about three parameters that people consider when they do that. And they're trivial, but they actually uh, have one interesting uh, element. The trivial ones is you usually put into the equation how likely are you to get caught when you say, I don't know, 10 out of 20, fine, I'm taking this risk. Multiply this by how big is the punishment if I do get caught? Will I lose her? Will he leave me? Will, will he leave me? Will we actually get like a better relationship? That's, here's the third one that's interesting. People usually put
put into the equation one more thing, which is how will it change my image of myself as an honest person? Mm. So mm. any person in jail, if you ask them why you do that, they have a story that somehow makes them an honest person. They say, yes, I stole the bread, but my family was starving and this mm. person didn't even need it. So it didn't matter to them. We never do things outside of what will keep the image of ourselves as honest. So even if we cheat, we say, yeah, but I'm doing that because it's actually going to help my relationship better because she won't care, she won't know, and I will then come home with more desire. Like, we always tell a story. We never, do it outside of, like, we, we never cheat really just saying, I want to hurt everyone, let's do that. Or I want to just, people always find some... Rationalization. Yes, we do that. Mm -hmm. And this component is an interesting part because this is something that if you, if you realize that this is something that is in the equation, you can actually investigate yourself. Because mm -hmm. the other two are very numeric. But this one is basically a psychological aspect. What is it that I'm going to have to do to put myself as an honest person? And this is something that uh, mm -hmm. you can A, use to stop yourself from doing that you don't want to do, or also to talk to the other person and say, this is, this is how I'm going to rationalize that if tomorrow I do that. Well, that's, so, that's the most interesting to me is then the conversation should begin with. So talk to me about how you thought about justifying this. Like, how did you rent maintain your integrity story right. around this because yeah. that's the core of the answer I agree. where so you it? are an asshole mm -hmm. and so i well what entitled you what, what you made feel you feel in the right yeah what was the second part what so, is so, why we cheat so, and the yes. other one is the other one is how do we recover from that yeah. Yeah. and here again it's it, I, I actually think now that they, it's not that boy but thousands of people out there. <laughs> and, um, so the the answer is that we know now something that we didn't know ten years ago about how memory works. And again, talk brain. Uh, we know that memories uh, are are not reliable, as in there's not something that you put in a hard drive and just put it every time. But we know that every time you Every time, if I ask you yesterday how was dinner last night, you pull the memory out and you tell me the story, and then you say it again. And if I ask you tomorrow how it was to have dinner, you're not going to pull the original one, you're going to put the one that you saved today. Mm -hmm. So every time you load the memory or use the memory, actually you save it, which means that there's good to that, which means that we can actually change. Because if we use memories again and again, we actually open them, make them volatile, make them vulnerable, and save them again. This is why therapy works. You go to therapy, she asks you, uh, uh, how do you feel about the breakup? You tell her story and she says, but maybe this is the case that actually is important for you to understand. And then you save it with a little bit more information. And then you come back next week and you open the <coughs> saved version that is a little bit better. And you do it again and again and again. And after 20 meetings, you actually have a memory of the event without the valence of it, like you don't mm -hmm. relieve the experiences, which means that the hope that I think everyone should have is that we can recover for, recover for everything. Like no matter how traumatic things were, there's a way out. The way out is to dig deep into that with the view that there's hope, because it's going to allow you to recover this, this experience and handle it. But it's not easy, but it actually means that memories are our way also to change. From a scientific point of view, do we know what trust is? Trust means that... In a very boring answer. So I feel like I'm taking over like, the science and we should go back to like, the, the interesting part. I think you should have heard it because it is a question. Because people say, I can't have sex yeah. with you, I, I can't trust you. Yeah. So here is... So, okay, so I'll, I'll break it into boring and I'll hopefully try to kind of count. So we know that there's a molecule in the brain that uh, if you take this molecule, then you become more trustworthy, or trusting, sorry. So I can, it's a pheromone that I can spray in this room right now, and if we play a game of trust, it right now and then afterwards when I spray this thing, we're going to be more trusting, going to give each other more money. So it means that in the, at the brain level, it's a molecular... Uh, Can uh, you intubate the molecule into so, my brain? So the interesting part is that it. it's the best <laughs> line that we, that we actually, that it comes, that it comes, uh, there's things in our life experiences that actually generate more or less. Orgasm is one of them. So we know people trust. are more trust. So we know that uh, after orgasm, there is a little more uh, trust. It's 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 because you've lost control. Maybe. Because so because there's a release or so. Something happened there, and then and then so this is a moment to you know now we can talk about like it. So right. but I have to stop you. I agree. That's a, uh, no 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 not because it's too much, but because we have to say goodbye. No, ten more minutes. Oh, we have to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just still stop me. I think. Oh, no, no, no. 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 No, no,
telling you to continue to talk, and they're glad you're they're glad. Right. Right. <laughs> but we do we only have time for ten more minutes, so. Great, great. No, no, continue. So trust and the, the mannequin and then? Remind. Yeah, yeah to remind so where we are. So that if you join us now, that we are actually um, an estate parent. We are in my home, Sunday evening, New York, with a group of my friends, as we are launching my new online workshop, Rekindling Desire, Essential Ingredients for a Passionate Life. We've invited all of you to be in a conversation with us, to see me in conversation with my friends and colleagues and be inspired to have similar conversations wherever you are in this world. If you register in this next hour, by 8.45 Eastern Time, New York Time, 8.45 p.m. We're, we, we blew past that, so it just, until we're done. If, ah. If I've got between now and when we're done, <laughs> which is about 10 more minutes because then I'm going to cut you guys off. Okay, so in the next 10 minutes, if you register for the online workshop, you get a whole bunch of bonuses. So I'm going to read for you so that I don't forget any of them. But the first one is that you get to be part of a draw that will take place tomorrow evening where one person or one couple will be able to meet with me for 45 minutes for a private session. If you're not in New York, on Skype or on FaceTime, and if you're in New York, in my office. Number two, you will receive a signed copy of my book, Mating in Captivity, which I will dedicate to you. Number three, you will be able to join the private Facebook group, which I think is actually an amazing component to this online workshop, which is the community of people that are participating. And we know it because we've already done trials with large groups, and so it's really, um, probably one of the most powerful things because many of you are in parts of the world where none of this gets addressed ever. I know it because you've been writing to me for years now. And what else do we give you? We give you one more thing. Ah, yes, if you are with a partner, you get a partner to register for free. And all of that will change dramatically in a very short amount of time. So these are the bonuses for joining the online workshop Rekindling Desire today. Okay, they want to hear more about the molecules of trust. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> Resident scientists, talk to us. I, mean, I, I don't know how much how sciencey it should be. There's a famous experiment that scientists play where they basically have two people play a game. The game is very simple. Person number one uh, gets ten dollars. He can keep the money, or he can uh, uh, share the money with the other person. So let's say you got ten dollars, you can say, you know, I'm giving you ten dollars, uh, five dollars. So you keep five, I get five. Then when you give me some money, the money gets multiplied, and then I get to give you back. It's a simple game that scientists play a lot, which basically says, how do people that uh, have the kind of good of themselves uh, in, in mind play partnership? Their yeah, well-being in mind. Exactly. Yeah, well -being. So, so, they, so they play this game a lot of times. And then they play the same game, and they spray this molecule in the air. And people start giving three times more money, the other person, so so they so just with this experiment, they kind of figured out that there is a molecule that you can actually uh, spit in the air. You can actually sniff it, and you can I mean, you can talk about like uh, what uses you can come up with. But I can tell you that a lot of perfume companies are coming to me and say, "Hey, we want that in our uh, in our perfume because it's so relevant." Can you actually is put it? molecules from the outside in? I mean, other than in a petri dish, can you can you Put molecules from the outside into the inside in a permanent way. Yeah, so, so I mean, so you, we, we can do that. So, so now it's. Well, give me some of that. Shit. I feel like I'm uh, getting too boring. <laughs> yeah, so, so the way that the way molecules work in the brain is that if I spray whatever these molecules are in the room right now, all of us are going to feel a little bit more trusty. We we won't smell it. It has no odor, but it will. Is it called alcohol by any chance? Just out of curiosity. Okay, but uh, it has a habituation effect. Meaning, we do it today, it's gonna work. If you do it tomorrow, or if you do it in ten minutes, it's not gonna work. So it, it has to like be in, in some kind of basis. Right. You, you, you can get addicted. You can get What tolerance. happens in the brain when trust is broken? Okay, so this is a, so this is now a much more complex system because trust is broken in a cognitive aspect. As in, you have to so for trust to be broken, brain, you have to have a definition of what trust is, mm -hmm. and you have to be broken. So if for the same experience. You can call it trust was broken, but trust was not broken. 
Now, mm-hmm. how do you call it? What do you call it? It's kind of basically your assumption. It's a shattering of assumption. This is where you go back. Yes. To, mm-hmm. to, to so those molecule okay. levels that actually decline after a cognitive shift? No. Here's, an, here's an anecdote that you're going to like. I'll give you one more, but it's uh, really uh, what we know recently from a study that came out, uh, in a very popular one, was that uh, this molecule exists also in the tears of women. So people for ages have been asking the question, why, why do people cry with water? Right? Like all animals have experiences, but only humans cry with water coming out of our eyes. And no one knew why that was the case. And then finally, what they did is they distilled the, the, the tears of women. They had men smell those tears. And what they saw is that the tears of women actually reduced the amount of testosterone in the main by 80%. They make the trust increase. What? And here's an the interesting thing. So this was like a very remarkable study. What's interesting is that I told you the result the way it was, but uh, the way it came, like in the media, is that a woman crying makes a man less aggressive. Hmm. However, it's not clear if it's only women's tears or if it's anyone's tears. The only reason they tried only women and had men as the participant is that they couldn't find men who agreed to cry in the lab. Yeah. <laughs> 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 now they tried to find men who did it to see if it's actually just tears in general oh, or just tears of women. What is the name of this molecule, this trust molecule? I mean, it's a, it's a variety of journals, but I, but I can figure that out. Oh, if for the next one we're gonna do, I'm gonna come up with. I, I wasn't prepared for that. This is like I felt that no one's gonna care about that. So now I feel like it's <laughs> here. <laughs> <laughs> nice nice food. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, a question to you that I feel. One. Is there a way for people to foster this independently? Like, is this is this something someone can do? You know, because I think that's what it is that people are wanting to know. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is it, the question of what is this molecule? Is essentially how can I rebuild this? So, is there something people can do on their own that doesn't require? Um, you know, a medical intervention. It's just like something they can... That's also, I think, getting into the trust of the nature of life and the intelligence of life and and the nature of our path and spirit. I think that also starts to call on a higher calling. Is the opposite of trust distrust or risk-taking? I don't know the answers to all of those questions. (laughs) I think they're two different things. First, there are people that I actively don't trust and will do the risks that I'm willing. The, the, the reason I'm asking is, in light of what you say, I have two questions. How does this scientific knowledge help me if my girlfriend, husband, partner, whatever, has cheated on me and betrayed my trust? How, does, how do I use this? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to cry. You have to be in the same room. The phone doesn't work. <laughs> and so part, so part of what you're talking about also is, I suppose, mirror neurons are part of this mm-hmm. whole experience yes. too, right? Is that something about, even if your eyes don't cry, but they look at me and they look into me, there is an element of trust that gets re- reignited, right? Mm-hmm. And the second part is because you know, some people need to feel trusting and safe to be sexual, and some people need to feel trusting and safe, but very differently, in order to be able to take risks and be sexual. It's a different kind of sexuality. Some mm-hmm. people need to be with someone who they know deeply and have been with, and and some people are and actually way more strange. able to be trusting with strangers mm-hmm. who they know won't hurt them sexually. But they are. It's a different trust. It's a different source of trust, but it now you become the resident philosopher. I agree. Yeah, I feel, I feel, I feel, usually, I come to you with the same questions you ask me. So, and like, what does that knowledge of this molecule do, do for, for me? So here's my my. I make a, a question right now, I, an answer to something that to a question that I really didn't think about until now, which is, what does the knowledge of those answers help? And I think that it helps in one way which is, um, I think, for any therapy, step one is to believe that the therapist can help yeah. and that you can change. And I think that knowing that there's some answer, there's some uh, uh, physiological mechanisms to that gives us one more element of trust that we can get oh. better. Mm-hmm. And when you come, when trust is broken and risk was taken and, and it didn't work out for you, what you lose first, I think, is the feeling of, uh, you get, get hopelessness, mm-hmm. mostly. You feel like maybe nothing's gonna work anymore, and you feel like you're kind of drowning in this, uh, this like quicksand and nothing's gonna help you. And I think that uh, when you're drowning in quicksand, 
uh, it's not that you need someone to throw, to push you out, or to pull you out of it and save you. It's that it's enough to have a little branch that's outside of the quicksand that you can hold on to yourself and pull yourself out. Mm -hmm. And so, so most of us feel that we, we need the therapist to kind of save us. And I think this is ideal, but it's not the case. Mostly we need to save ourselves, but we need to have someone outside. Okay, so what so I heard sizes. from what you just said is that for all the people who have written to us tonight and over the last few weeks around the question of how do I rekindle desire, how do I reconnect sexually in the aftermath of a betrayal, the first thing you're saying is you need to know that these betrayals, one recovers from them, that trust can be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And that is the construct from which you start, rather than once a cheater, always a cheater, once a liar, always a liar, once you've hurt me, how do I know you won't hurt me again? And now I'm going to live in constant fear that this will never happen again. And not even in this relationship, but how do I know that I'm not permanently now damaged? Right. Mm -hmm. And so what, you, what you've just given is a basic line that says, these are experiences from which, there, what did you say? There is no experience from which we cannot recover. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very, very yeah. hopeful statement, from, be it from flatness, from numbness, from betrayal, you know, in the experience of rekindling design. So we can continue, but we have to say goodbye to... Well, you can wrap it up. We can wrap it up. We're, we're it's a couple minutes away from nine, which, first of all, thanks everyone for being here later than I promised you. Um, it's 8.57, so, so yeah, wrap it up. Got three minutes and then we'll close it down. So Mike, I have a question for all of you. What's, you know, do you have these conversations often and what's, or not, and what's mm -hmm. it like? I think it's so useful for a group of us to be vulnerable and feel awkward and right struggle with it because it says a lot about how tough these conversations are to have. Like we're a really willing and invested group here, and we're still there's still things that people might feel shy, sort of you know, say self disclose too much or or worry about the uh, judgment of others. And so I mean, I think that the piece about compassion needs to be a part of it. Also, like everyone's somewhere different on the spectrum of readiness to talk about this. Like I think about your religious mm -hmm. person. And then, you know, whatever, the person who's ready to be an employee in this relationship and everybody in between. So I, that's sort of one of my takeaways is to be really thoughtful about where, where people are at, their level of readiness and the sort of compassion that we all need to be having for one another that, that that's a spectrum and it's a process and a journey, you know. I, I am fascinated by the ratio of how much we think about this and how little we talk about it. And I really notice it in every TED Talk. Go to Esther's TED Talks. Go to TED.com or Esther Perel on TED.com. And what you see in all of those TED Talks is the faces of the people when the camera pans through. This is, and I've seen a thousand TED Talks. I've never seen a crowd that's like this. There's sort of a... <laughs> It's that, oh, oh my God, oh my God, there's a conversation about the thing I think about all day long and I never talk about it. No one ever talks about it. Not in really open, it's always highly charged with shame or loss or infidelity, something like that. This is an uncharged conversation about a very thing that we all think about all the time. I think, firstly, um, you know, a lot of you know about your friend. There is a lot of openness in the community that we're part of, and there is a lot of discussion here. But I think that if you look at how we started the conversation around these questions, what we did is a lot of inferring as to where this question was coming from, followed by a discussion of, of what we thought. And I think that when you are in your community, the questions that you ask say just as much to the people that are around you as the discussions thereafter. And that can be really scary. Because if I'm in a relationship and sitting with my friends and I ask the question of, I have, you know, if you have a significant other that is going to be, you know, flirting too much, then my girlfriend sitting right there should be like, serious? Like, like mm -hmm. that's how you're asking this question. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the people in the room are going to know exactly what I'm talking about and what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think just the nature of this format is, is, is helpful because it does provide prompts for a really deep conversation without, you know, us having the ability to think about exactly to understand. Yeah, just the right amount of distance. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, but it's also interesting <clears throat> because we are doing this now in front of the camera and we are talking and we don't know who's his name, 
and maybe when we switch off the camera, we will carry on a conversation here that will be probably very different than mm -hmm. what happened just now. So, so that maybe can be carried on to your pro uh, your project, your web project, where people are signing up and and that conversation carries on in a different way. What I can say is that <coughs> the, the most moving feedback we get is people who say, we started a conversation with our partner, with my partner, that we'd never had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that a lot of what I do is to facilitate these conversations. And that people actually suddenly, it's interesting. They're curious about themselves. They're curious mm -hmm. about this partner. They thought they knew each other. They actually don't know that side of them. They know other things, but that side of them. And there's no age for discovering that whole thing. It's rich. It's actually really rich and interesting. And uh, I'm, so I'm less concerned with why we don't talk about it. I totally understand why we don't. I understand we grew up in silence about it. I have the judgment, the fear, the guilt, and all thing. But I'm very intrigued with seeing people have conversations mm -hmm. with each other they never had, be it mm -hmm. in my office or be it online, through the course, the, the kind of things they write. I mean, we got, you know, I have 1,500 letters just like that that arrived. And, and when we do the survey, we have 3,000 people on the survey site. Like, it's it, everybody is asking actually worldwide a rather similar set of questions. It's very interesting, even from traditional cultures, from from very from very liberal progressive cultures, the questions are quite the same. And uh, <clears throat> and I think that maybe the time has come to actually for the first time begin to talk about this subject in a way like we do, not charged, but interesting, intellectual, artistic, scientific, mm -hmm. you know, personal, with a, just enough distance, a whole thing like that. Um, and I think that it, it will happen because we have too much sex and too many sexual problems and too many sexual health issues and too, sex is intersecting with every part mm -hmm. of our life. Do not talk about it. It's basically almost a public health crisis when you don't talk about it. It's bad for society. It's bad. It's bad for gender. It's bad for women. It's bad for kids. It's bad for abuse. It's bad for. It's bad to so to keep that subject on the wrap. It's really that. And the reason it's been kept on the wrap is because there's been a fear in every civilization that if you let it out too much, it will create chaos and disorder. And so every culture has tried to control it. And yet every mechanism of controlling it has actually created often very negative consequences. So there's a whole political, cultural, societal mission, if I can use the word mission, to the conversation that is beyond just all of us in our intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, everybody. Rekindling Desire. Mm -hmm. Check it out. EstherPerel.com. <laughs>